Good afternoon, Rhode Island beekeepers and other Massachusetts clubs. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Scott. My name is Scott Langless. I'm the current president of Rhode Island Beekeepers. Um, so I, I want to introduce our speaker today, Gary Ruder. Uh, he's a researcher at the University of Minnesota, uh, part of the Bee Lab there. Uh, for those of you who may know, I mean, the University of Maryland, uh, Minnesota Bee Lab is one of the most prestigious, if not the most prestigious bee labs in the country. Um, you probably have all seen Marla Spivak's TED Talk uh, or heard about the work she's done. Gary has, has worked with her for a long time. Um, for those of you over the last couple of years who took part in Reba's Queen Grant, uh, one of the, the breeds that we brought in were the Minnesota hygienic bees. Um, the, the grant was to bring in queens of a superior genetic nature. Uh, a, a lot of those queens that we brought in were Minnesota hygienic. Uh, Gary is part of the team that worked on, on that line. Um, so it's exciting to have him here. I, I know I personally in my yard, um, right now almost all my bees are descended from those Minnesota hygienics and they're, they're doing great. Um, for those of you who, who were at our last in-person meeting, uh, you know, we talked a lot about propolis, and there's a lot of research being done, again, with Marla at, at the lab there uh, on, on the benefits of propolis for both for bees and for humans. So hopefully, uh, maybe even in, in the question and answer period, we can have him uh, speak to that a little bit. So I guess without further ado, I want to introduce Gary Ruder. Gary. All right. Thank you, Scott. Um, and thanks for having me. Um, I kind of miss being able to uh, look out and see everybody, um, but uh, it, it's great to be able to do it um, because of the circumstances. Um, obviously, we can't all get together, so this is uh, the next best thing. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about biology today, uh, and, and uh, we certainly don't have time uh, to, to talk about everything in terms of bees that would uh, probably take forever. Uh, so I'm, I basically have picked out things that have to do with uh, bee management. So uh, things that you need to think about in terms of biology that uh, make a difference in what you're doing with your bees. And um, I was glad to hear Scott talk about the uh, I do that every once in a while. I'll say, well, the bees think this or the bees think that. And um, that's, that's putting our human touch on it. Um, we, we don't know how much they actually think. And I get in trouble uh, when I say that amongst researchers. But, um, so that's kind of a, uh, a start on where I hope to go through this whole thing. And um, so the, the one question is, do you want to be a better beekeeper? And I think uh, we all want to be a better beekeeper. And um, I started this talk a couple of years ago, and uh, it was about this time of year. And one of my first things uh, was that if you want to be a better keep beekeeper, uh, maybe you should move out of Minnesota. <laughs> so this is... Uh, Two years ago now, uh, our packages came in. This was April 19th, uh, and you can see we're putting them in in the snow. And um, now for bees that just came from California, I probably wasn't uh, welcome to Minnesota uh, situation. Um, so that, that was April 19th. We actually um, put bees in in the snow the year before that uh, and every year since. Um, so I put, I put this up, this is uh, the day before uh, we had gone out and put all the boxes out, had everything ready to go. And then uh, we had to shovel the snow off the tops of the boxes in order to get uh, the covers off and get the bees in. And uh, it was a little bit of a challenge to put them in, but I'm uh, happy to say that uh, we put the bees in there, they were, uh, the um, you know they clustered up. We have a feeder on them when they're ready to go. Um, we did have a situation with uh, you can see most of these we did with uh, foundation 
or draw and comb, I mean, but we did have uh, 10 colonies in experiment. We were starting on foundation. And when we went, went out the next day to test, to look at them, uh, three of them, all the bees were on the bottom board. Uh, quite frankly, they looked like they were dead. Um, so we uh, packed them up, brought them inside, and we left them inside uh, for the day. By the end of the day, they were came back to life. They were clustered up around around the feeder, and we put them back outside, and they were fine. So um, the bees can deal with quite a bit uh, in terms of weather, but um, no, it was not a pleasant hiving <laughs> hiving packages day there. Um, I did a little bit of a, a weather um, survey, if you will. And uh, I got these Pro Providence, Rhode Island, that I think is fairly close to where you are. And if you compare the highs and lows throughout the season, you're not too much uh, different from us, um, at least number-wise. Uh, we get a little bit colder in January. Um, but you can see if you lived in Phoenix, it's a whole different story. So when I talk around the country, uh, if I'm down in Phoenix, I always, um, they always talk about winter, you know, they do this and that with their bees in the winter. And I'm like, you guys don't have winter, okay? Um, it, it's, <laughs> you might think you have winter, but you don't have winter. Um, but then they point out their uh, temperatures there in July and August, uh, and they let me know that we don't have summer either. So uh, one of my main reasons for bringing that up is there's a lot of information out there, um, particularly on the internet. Uh, and one of the things that you should be careful of when you're um, looking at what other people are saying they do at their bees and don't do, uh, is look at where they live. Um, so some of the things that we do up here in the North just uh, don't translate to uh, down in the South and vice versa. So keep that in mind, um, that has nothing to do with biology, but what the heck. So in terms of uh, being a better beekeeper, I, I really think that if you need to learn about the biology and the behavior of bees, uh, if you wanna be a good beekeeper, oftentimes you look at your colony and you're trying to decide what you should do. Um, and if you'd stop and think about what the bees uh, need, uh, what they want, you'll have a better idea of uh, how you should go about dealing with the management. Um, one of the things that I uh, like to say is that you need to think like a bee. Uh, and this will come up uh, probably at the talk. Um, but not only do you need to know about the biology and behavior of the bees, but also of the pests. So uh, I'm, I'm sure you all know Varroa is uh, one of our biggest problems in beekeeping and um, you need to learn about that also. And I'm, I'm not gonna cover that today, uh, there's just not time, but uh, learn as much as you can about uh, how the Varroa uh, reproduces, what its behaviors are, and it will help you uh, controlling uh, that pest. Okay. So I'm gonna start out with honey. Uh, you guys uh, all know that bees make honey. Uh, the, the question is why do they make honey? Why are bees making honey? And primarily uh, it's their food, uh, but they could just drink nectar. They don't have to have honey uh, for a food, but they convert it to honey so that it will be preserved so that it's their winter food. And uh, whether you, we have winter up here like we do or down south, uh, winter is winter. That means a time uh, for the bees when there are no flowers. Uh, so they need to collect that nectar, turn it into honey, and be able to store it for future use. The other bees, uh, for instance, this is a bumblebee uh, colony. Uh, we do uh, a fair amount of studies on bumblebees also in our lab uh, and other native bees too. Um, but bumblebees are a little bit like 
uh, honeybees in that they uh, have a nest, uh, a social nest. And uh, if you look at uh, there, that uh, little cell there has a nectar in it. But bumblebees uh, do not convert it into honey. Uh, they eat it uh, as nectar, they store it. It's only for a short amount of time uh, because bumblebees don't winter over uh, in their nests. They, they have a whole different strategy for wintering over. And so they go around, they collect nectar and pollen, um, but they don't turn it into honey. So I'm, I'm sure you all know that the bees go out and collect uh, the nectar from flowers. Uh, you can see this bee uh, in the left-hand flower is uh, not a honeybee, that's a native bee. Uh, so uh, oftentimes you'll see them side by side. Uh, they don't fight with each other. They, uh, I think they have the theory there's enough around for everybody and so they uh, will be on the flowers together. Um, but one of the things I want to point out uh, about their foraging, and that is that uh, the bees come out uh, and forage. They um, bring that to the entrance, and that nectar is actually kept in the brood nest uh, for a period of time. Uh, the bees add an enzyme to it, which converts the sugars, uh, and then they dry it down, and then uh, it's moved up into the upper story of the hive. Uh, in our case, it's moved up into supers in a natural colony. They just, that's where they store the honey uh, up above the brood nest. So one of the things that uh, I, I hear from people is they have three or four supers on top of their colony and they say, uh, I'm gonna put an entrance up on top to save the bees having to walk all the way up to the top to put the honey up there. And actually what you're doing is you're, you're screwing them up, okay? Because uh, there won't be any uh, receiving bees up there. The foraging bee does not come into the hive and go put the nectar wherever it's supposed to be. The foraging bee comes in, hands it off to a, uh, another bee, uh, who then takes it and uh, puts it somewhere in the brood nest until it's honey, and then another bee moves it up. And so if you put an entrance up here, the foragers come back here, they have to go all the way down here in order to hand off that uh, nectar. So uh, sometimes we think we're helping uh, when we're not. So think, think of it more like a, uh, a warehouse and the uh, bees are bringing, are the truckers, okay? Trucker pulls up to the warehouse, and uh, if the trucker thought, well, maybe I'll help them out, and I'll just drive over to uh, the other side of the warehouse where this stuff is supposed to go, not real helpful, because the forklift driver who's gonna take it off his truck is not there. Um, so uh, that's the, the foraging technique, uh, for bees that I think you need to keep in mind. Uh, the other thing that bees do is a dance, and I, I bring this up, that I, I can't tie it to manuscript, but I think it's one of the really cool things. Uh, and if you want some uh, exciting stuff, uh, study more about the dance language. Uh, we have uh, some students who are doing a project on uh, native flowers and trying to determine you know which flowers are better for bees and which ones aren't etc and they actually record the dances of the bees and then interpret them and they can figure out where the bees are telling other bees to go to the flowers uh, there are two dances the uh, round dance is a uh, for flowers close to the hive so they come in, they do that circle dance, they share um, some of the nectar that they receive so that uh, the bees know what they're looking for. And they basically go out and it's pretty close, they can go find it. When it's farther away, they do this waggle dance. Um, and the way this works is the bee follows these arrows. Actually, there's not arrows in the hive, okay? 
those zeros I put here. But they do this circle. And then when they do this straight line, they kind of waggle their abdomen. And then they go around the circle the other way and they come back and wag their abdomen. In amongst all of that as information, one is the, the direction that they do this straight line run uh, tells the other bees what direction to go when they exit the hive. And uh, so if it's straight up like this would mean go directly toward the sun. If they were running at a 90 degree angle, it would mean go out and go 90 degrees to the sun. In addition to that, uh, however uh, fast they waggle while they're doing this run, uh, tells them uh, how good the nectar is, okay, how much sugar is in it. And how long it takes them to make this circle around and come back tells the other bees the distance from the hive out to where the flowers are. And <clears throat> because of that, the dancing, uh, if it's relatively close and it's uh, real good nectar, this bee will be very active and will attract her bees to come over and watch her and follow them. And so it's a way for the bees to be able to go out and capitalize on the better uh, nectar that's out there available to them. Uh, I want to mention about water. Uh, bees collecting uh, collect water for a number of things. Uh, one is uh, they just drink water just like all other animals do. Uh, they also use it to uh, dilute uh, the honey when they want to eat it. Uh, and they use it to bring in uh, and use it as a cooling device in the colony. Uh, the main reason I bring that up is if you're particularly, uh, if you're in a uh, urban setting, uh, you don't want your bees going to the neighbors to collect water. Um, bees out collecting water, we all know are uh, docile, they're not going to cause them any uh, trouble, um, but not all people like bees as much as we like bees. <laughs> they're not willing to share their pool uh, or their water spigot and those kinds of things. So I always suggest that you supply water on your property for the bees. And bees also have this, uh, well, I call it a weird thing. Uh, they don't go up to the water and drink it up like, uh, like your dog does, your cat does. They like to suck the water out of the edge of the pool. And so have something in the water um, for them to be able to suck it out of. Uh, you'll see on uh, the bottom, we have a cement block in there and you can see the bees are uh, on the block sucking the water out. They're not down at the edge trying to get it out of uh, the pool of water itself. Um, why they do that, I have no idea. So keep that in mind if you're providing water. We um, throw some tennis balls in there. They love to suck it out of the tennis balls. Um, and I always envision them getting enough bees together and do a sort of a, a bee log rolling thing. Um, I've never seen that actually happen, but I think it'd be fun. Uh, one of the other things uh, uh, Scott mentioned, the propolis. Uh, bees collect that propolis uh, from plants and plants uh, produce it as uh, antimicrobial substance to protect them from uh, bacteria and fungus and uh, all those kinds of things. And so the bees go get it and bring it back to the hive for that same purpose. Um, we've been doing a lot of studies on propolis over the last few years, and it's a not well understood thing at this point. Um, we do know and we've, we've shown through a lot of studies that bees that have a fair amount of propolis in their colony are healthier uh, than colonies that don't have propolis. So for years, uh, we were uh, breeding bees that did not collect a lot of propolis um, because for a beekeeper, propolis is sort of a pain in the butt. 
uh, makes everything stick together and it uh, gets all of your hands and clothes and all that. Um, but we are now in a breeding program and part of our uh, criteria is to actually breed for colonies that collect a lot of propolis. The next thing that we're working on uh, to maybe come up with a compromise with the bees and that is to find some way that we can get them to put that propolis in a place where it's not such a problem for us. So rather than covering the ends of the frames with it and all of like that, uh, we're working on um, having boxes that are not smooth out on the inside. So that is, uh, we'll put it around the entire outside of the box rather than concentrate on the frame area. And this is in fact what they do in nature. Uh, when we started this study, we um, managed to get a number of uh, native nests, uh, feral nests from trees. Um, if there's a tree that needs to be cut down in the cities and it has bees in it, you don't have to talk too hard to the tree person to get them to donate that portion of the tree to you because they don't want to have anything to do with the uh, bees. And uh, when we open them up on the inside, they have covered the entire uh, inside cavity uh, with propolis. And uh, so that's what we're working on in that aspect. Uh, I think most of you know that the uh, bees in the summer only live about six weeks. And um, that's important in that if you don't have a really good queen who's laying a lot of eggs and you have a lot of brood so that you can replace those bees on a regular basis, your colony is not going to thrive. Um, there are two reasons for them. Uh, it's probably more than that, but two main reasons I know why they only live six weeks. Uh, the first three weeks of their life, they're inside the hive doing in, in hive chores. It's pretty safe in there, right? So uh, if you're inside, uh, there are a bunch of guard bees on uh, the entrance. Uh, if there's, you know, what, 20, 30,000 other bees in there with you, uh, it's pretty safe. Once the bee is about three weeks old, uh, she becomes a field bee, what we call a field bee. And at that point, they become either guards at the entrance uh, or they go out and forage. Uh, if they're guards and they end up uh, having to sting uh, in order to protect the hive, they die from that, as you know. If uh, they become a forager, they're now out in the wild world, and that's um, a dangerous place to be. Uh, they may get uh, eaten by a bird, they may get splatted on the windshield of a car, um, they may um, get squashed by something, uh, but at any rate, it, it's dangerous. Uh, if they live out, oops, here. If they live out their normal uh, life, what happens is you can see their wings are kind of shredded there. Uh, they're just wearing out after uh, numerous flights out to the flowers. One day they um, go out, their wings are too tattered, they can't get back and they die out in the field. Um, I put this up here uh, primarily if I talk to uh, non-beekeepers uh, because they have no idea that's uh, not a regular wing. Uh, this is what the wing should look like, uh, nice and smooth and not worn off and tattered like that. One of the things that's come up uh, in a few years is uh, people wanting to save the bees and what I hear from them is um, I just want to have bees. I want to uh, save the bees. I don't want the honey. Um, but the fact of the matter is if you have a colony uh, of honeybees and it's healthy, then they make honey. Uh, and they'll make a lot of honey if everything is good. And so if you uh, 
try to keep bees and not want to have honey, uh, that's not a good thing. So this is, I put this up there to make you guys all jealous. Um, this is not by far not a uh, typical hive, but it's not uh, unheard of uh, up here. And what I point out to um, particularly the public and which is amazing thing to me about bees is that uh, they collected all of this honey in, um, you know, what, four months of summer. Uh, that uh, attributes to about 300 pounds of honey, maybe a little bit more. Uh, we leave 100 pounds of honey in those bottom three boxes for winter. Uh, the, the rest of that is uh, what we would extract. But if you stop to think that the bees go out and uh, collect nectar from flowers, they collect uh, one drop at a time. They probably have to collect at least two drops of nectar to make one drop of honey. Um, that's pretty dang amazing that they can make that much honey in that short amount of time. And uh, granted, that colony probably had 40, 50,000 bees in it. Uh, but even so, I find that pretty amazing um, that they can pull that off. Uh, so the other thing that they collect from flowers is pollen. And uh, I find this really interesting. So my, my dad was a beekeeper and uh, when I was little, you know, they talked about pollen baskets and then I always thought it, it was a bat, like an Easter basket, you know? And uh, then they talked about collecting pollen in a pollen trap. And I thought what they did is they made the bee uh, walk into the colony upside down so the pollen fell out of the basket. And um, imagine my surprise when I found out that was all wrong. Okay. So uh, the way they do it is they put it on what we call a basket. It's really uh, some hairs. And I have a, another picture, you'll see that closely. But they pack it onto their back leg in this little uh, pellet. And I'm, I'm sure you've all seen this. Uh, going in your colony. Um, and it turns out the way we get them uh, to get that off in the pollen trap is make them go through a space that is so small that it knocks that off when they go into the colony. Um, this uh, corbicula is what that uh, basket is called in a scientific world. So if you want to uh, impress your friends and neighbors, um, Write that down quick because I won't be able to respell it for you later. So the bees store pollen uh, in the cells. Typically do not uh, mix uh, pollen and nectar, although they will put uh, in the fall of the year, they will cover pollen uh, with nectar to finish filling the cell up. You'll notice all the different colors there. Of course, that's from different flowers. And other than making a pretty picture, we really um, have determined in recent years the importance for bees of having a lot of different kinds of pollen. All of those pollens contain different micronutrients in them, uh, which the bees require. And so a variety of pollen coming into the colony is advantageous for that. So here's, here's the cool pictures. So uh, this is the corbicula or the little hairs that they pack that uh, pollen on. But the uh, rest of the innocent thing it will go around in the flower and it gets pollen all over the hairs of its body. Um, uh, just as an aside, the, the, one of the big differences between a, a wasp and a bee is that a bee has split hands on its hairs, and a wasp has, does not, okay? And so if you ever want to identify, you look really, really close at the hairs, and you can tell. And the reason they have that split hair is it helps collect pollen. So um, the pollen grains are actually really, really small. It's more like a uh, flower when they're getting it off of the, um, not the, not the flower flower, but, you know, baking flower. Um, 
So when it gets on all over their body, what they have are these combs on their legs. And they can move their leg around and they can scrape all that pollen off of their body and bring it down to this uh, part between their legs. And there's this little press here and it, it's kind of like a player's. And uh, that's how they pack it into the ball. And so they pack it a bunch of that together and then they stick it onto this corbicular. And a lot of times they'll do this while they're flying. They'll, uh, if you watch real close, the bee will move a couple inches away from the flower and kind of hover there. And uh, if you see them uh, raking their body with their uh, leg, uh, that's what they're doing is they're getting that packed up uh, onto their back leg. And it's, uh, it's kind of fun to watch. It's amazing that they can, they can do that. So the prote protein is uh, the bees need to feed the larvae. Uh, and I want to point out, I hear uh, beekeepers from time to time uh, tell uh, the general public that the bees feed pollen to their larvae, uh, and they do not. The, uh, the process is that the, the nurse bees eat the uh, pollen, which is the protein, that stimulates their glands to secrete the food that they feed to the larvae. So every once in a while, you'll see one like this one here. It's got a little bit of pollen in there. Uh, and that either fell in there or was uh, left in there from a previous, you know, that cell had pollen in it or something. It was, it was not fed there on purpose. You can see all of the other ones, there's no pollen. Uh, it's all the food that it comes from a gland in their head. Uh, so just to give you a couple of more big words you can write down, uh, these are the two glands. Uh, there's a hypopharyngeal gland and the mandibular gland. And those are the glands that make that uh, food that they feed to the larvae. And um, this is going to come up a little bit later too, but uh, these glands, the queen does not have these glands. This is a um, kind of a different thing for from most insects. The queen bee in a honeybee colony cannot feed her own young. Uh, she needs to have workers there that can feed that. These glands, when a queen becomes a queen, these glands become uh, pheromone glands uh, as opposed to food glands. So another uh, biological thing, and these uh, numbers are uh, pretty important for you to keep in mind. Uh, and uh, these are kind of uh, average numbers, um, but have a general idea what they are. I usually round them off. Um, but whether it's a, a worker egg, a drone egg, or a queen egg, they all uh, are an egg for three days before they hatch and then they become a larvae. Uh, the larvae are um, in that larval stage, uh, shorter for a queen and, and longer for a drone. And uh, exactly why it is, we don't, uh, we don't know. I'm gonna back up for just a minute because you can see here the different sizes. So this, this larvae here, on this one right here, that's about the same size of an egg. That's a one day old larvae. Uh, and then you move up to this is probably a two day old and a three day old uh, and a four day old and there aren't any five day olds on this one. Uh, a five day old larvae is about as big as the bottom or the back of the cell. So, uh, in uh, insect talk, these are instars. So you have first in, oops, um, that's you have first instar, second instar, third instar, fourth instar. And what that means is that the larvae has grown to a certain size. It now is outgrown its skin, it sheds its skin, and it starts growing again. Uh, in uh, honeybees, that 
uh, instar is about 24 hours. And so after five days, it becomes a fifth instar larvae. At that point, then uh, it starts to pupate. Uh, it's the bees put the cap over top of the cell. The larva spins a cocoon inside of that um, cell, and then it starts its pupating. And these are the number of days uh, that it's a pupa. So the reason that this is interesting is that if you go to a colony and you notice that, uh, you know, let, let's say you're queenless, and then uh, you look in there and there's no queen, there's no eggs, uh, but you have uh, third three-day-old larvae in there and four-day-old and five-day-old. What that tells you is that your queen was killed three, four, five days ago. And if you go back to your records and you see that you were in the colony five days ago, it's a pretty good guess as to why your colony went queenless. Okay. So these numbers uh, and looking at what's in the colony can give you a lot of information uh, about what's going on within the colony. So what are the differences between the queens and the workers and the drones? Um, and you can see that the worker has wax glands, the other two do not. The worker uh, has a barb sting, which is the reason uh, it dies when it stings. The queen has a smooth sting, so if it does have to uh, use its sting, and in most cases it's uh, against another queen, she doesn't really defend the hive, but at, at least she doesn't die from that. Uh, the drones do not have a sting. Um, ovarials are the gland in the body that eggs are developed in, and uh, the queen has a uh, well-developed uh, worker has, uh, we know that they have some, but not very many. Uh, that's how you get laying workers. Um, queen does not have a honey crop, so she can't go out and collect uh, nectar. Um, the worker uh, does, if the worker's got food glands, the queen does not. And the drone doesn't have any of this stuff. Um, and I should have put down the one thing that the drone does have, um, but it's a family uh, talk. So the, uh, a lot of times uh, when we talk about how the drone doesn't do anything, I want to point out that the drone's got a good excuse for that, okay? Not that the drone doesn't want to make wax uh, or protect the hive. They just don't have uh, the physical tools to be able to do it. So how does a queen become a queen? Um, that, that's the big question. And actually, specifically, uh, we don't know. Um, but in general, uh, any fertilized egg could be a queen or a worker. And unfertilized eggs uh, become drones. Um, so the queen, the queen when she um, was first mated, all of the sperm she collects during that mating period is stored in a sperm of theca. And um, I have a picture coming up a little bit later, but uh, she has the sperm that she needs to fertilize the eggs when she lays them. So if it's going to be a queen or a worker, it's fertilized. If it's going to be a drone, uh, she does not fertilize it. And then all the larvae in the colony are fed royal jelly for the first 24 to 48 hours, uh, closer to 24. Uh, after that, the larvae that are going to be workers, uh, they get switched to bee bread. Uh, why we call it bee bread, I have no idea. But um, it's still brood food, but it's of a different nutritional consistency. And uh, it has to do with the um, percentage that comes from each of those two glands I told you about. And so more of one gland than the other. and uh, you get either royal jelly or this bee bread. So the, the bee bread is a little bit lower in terms of nutritional value. So if it's gonna be a queen, then they're fed royal jelly through their entire larval life. And because of that change in nutrition, the 
um, larvae uh, turns into a queen when it becomes uh, a pupa. Queens are raised in uh, vertical cells and they're uh, bigger than uh, a worker brood cell. Uh, worker brood is a horizontal cell, which you're uh, mostly used to seeing. So those are the main things that uh, are different. Uh, one of the questions is, well, how do they pick uh, which larvae there is, is going to be a queen? And uh, again, we don't know that for sure. There is some thought that uh, certain workers are preferential to their uh, closest relatives, but so far that's not been able to be proven. Um, because it's very difficult to prove. Um, in most cases, the queen has been mated with uh, 12 drones. And so there are basically 12 subfamilies within the colony. And whether or not a worker can tell that a larvae uh, had the same father that she had, uh, we have no way of knowing. Um, I, I personally am under the uh, the impression that it's pretty much random. Uh, somewhere along the line, one of them just picks one and uh, once it gets started, then the rest of them say, okay, uh, you know, cells vertical and uh, if she got royal jelly before, I'll give her royal jelly now. Um, but we really don't know uh, how they pick which one it's gonna be. So uh, when do the bees raise queens in the colony? And uh, they do it when they're gonna swarm. They do it during a soup procedure and they do it in an emergency. So uh, if these terms are foreign to you, uh, hang on, because I'm gonna uh, explain more, in more detail uh, in just a minute. But then when do they uh, raise the best queens? And, um, the answer is in this same order. So the best queens uh, are done at swarming time, the next best uh, at super procedure, and the not so best is in emergency. And uh, I'm gonna explain why uh, that's the case. Let me start with swarming. So uh, what, what, what is swarming? Swarming is reproduction, okay? So reproduction happens in a colony at two levels. And one is uh, you have new bees coming out. And uh, of course that's reproduction, um, but uh, not unlike humans. So I, I had to get in this uh, treat them like people kind of things. The, the swarming reproduction is uh, starting a new family, okay? So, um, hang on. Uh oh, Gary, did we lose uh, you? Oh, there we go. Gary, I can't get my ten seconds. Yeah. Can you get my cursor to go where I want it to go? Got it. Okay, I got out of sequence here, hang on. Okay, here we go, okay. I had to find my baby. So, uh, why, why did they swarm? Because it's a, uh, uh, a new family. Uh, they do it when the time is right. So, uh, we of course try to put our uh, thinking into this. Basically, uh, it's when resources are good, the colony is large, uh, the weather is good. Uh, specifically, uh, I'll be honest with you, I've seen bees swarm when, uh, as far as I can tell, the time was not right, but apparently they thought it was right. Um, so uh, how do they know it's time and uh, parents kick them out, that's my uh, connection to the uh, human side of it. 
we don't know uh, how they all get together and take off. Uh, if you want to do some uh, nice reading on uh, swarming Tom Seeley's book on that, uh, he's done a lot of studies on that, and it's kind of fun uh, how they uh, do that. Okay. So it's a little bit like um, our reproduction. So uh, we have babies, and that's the like emerging brood, and then at some point they grow up uh, and they leave. Okay, they leave the home. So um, honeybees are a little bit different in that uh, for bees, the old queen leaves uh, and leaves behind the, the new young queen. Uh, for humans, and typically uh, the parents stay behind and uh, the, the young move out and start a new home. So they're a little bit backwards from us. Um, there's another big word for you, anthropomorphic is the uh, uh, where you put human characteristics onto uh, animals which um, i do it all the time okay. uh, so these are some typical swarm cells so when the colony is decided okay i'm i'm uh, we're going to swarm now uh it's getting too crowded here or you know uh i'm sick of all the kids in the house or whatever the reason they use for why to move the first thing they do is uh, they want to make sure that the colony that they leave behind is in good shape. And so they make these queen cells so that when the old queen leaves and uh, then, then the new, the old colony still has capability of continuing on. And so uh, when those cells get sealed, uh, shortly thereafter is when the swarm leaves. Um, there is a, uh, a period in there, you know, maybe four or five days, uh, that could happen at any one of those times. But basically, before any new queens start to emerge, the old queen, uh, and, you know, we always say half the workers, but some percentage of the workers go how they decide which ones are gonna go and which ones are gonna stay, we don't know. Um, but they take off, uh, look for a, a new home. Um, this, I don't know that this shows up really well on your screen, but the, these are all bees in the air during flight. Um, if you've never been uh, in a swarm, then uh, you're really missing out. This is so cool. I mean, there are literally thousands of bees in the air flying around. We just happen to be in this bee yard when, um, this is my friend's colony, right? My bees don't swarm. Um, so uh, we happened to be there when they took off. It was just incredible. They you know, just stand there and the bees are flying around you. Uh, and uh, just like we, uh, reading the books, they're, they're not aggressive at all. They're just going crazy. Uh, and pretty soon they start to head uh, toward the same direction and uh, helps to have somebody there to point it out to you. Uh, this is Katie Lee when she was one of our students. Uh, and you can see the bees kind of in the background around her. And uh, well, this is a little close up of them. So and eventually they land uh, in one place. And uh, th this was a little weird. They actually landed in two places. And uh, why they did that, uh, I'm not exactly sure. Um, but I did want to show you how big that swarm is compared to our truck. So it, you can see it's like as big as the truck. Um, if there are any photographers out there, you can. Um, they're probably getting on the chat line right now on this whole idea of perspective, et cetera, because uh, it really wasn't as big as a truck. Um, eventually, these two uh, came together uh, in one place. And then what they do is they now go out and look for a new home. So they scout, scout bees, uh, look for a hollow tree or maybe an empty beehive you got laying around, whatever it is. Um, 
scumpies go out, they uh, find different areas, they come back to the hive, they do a dance uh, similar to the dances they use for communicating the um, flowers, the nectar, and uh, pretty soon they decide that uh, they all agree we're going to this place and they all take off in one big uh, swarm and uh, inhabit the new hive and they start out. So the advantage for bees to do this is that they, uh, the queen that leaves is already, uh, well, it's not exactly ready because just before uh, they left, she had to stop laying eggs to get her weight down. She, um, a full-size queen in the middle of uh, egg laying season probably can't fly very well. So she has to stop uh, her egg laying, get down to flying weight. But shortly after they find their new home, probably within two days or less, uh, she'll be laying eggs and they can get their new colony started. Whereas the colony that's back uh, at the hive, uh, the cells have to uh, emerge and uh, then the queen, she spends a day or two, uh, she goes around the hive, gets rid of any other queens that might be in there. Then she uh, goes out on her mating flights and then she comes back and it takes a few days for the sperm to get into the spermatheca before she starts laying eggs. So it's probably another couple of weeks before that colony is laying eggs. But they still have brood emerging from when uh, the queen laid eggs just before she left. And so that colony is also going to survive. Uh, so a little bit on management uh, for swarming. Uh, there's a lot more than, than I can cover here today, but uh, generally speaking, the colony is very strong. Uh, it's typical to see a colony like this even after it is swarmed. Um, they're so strong that when you go look at them, you go, oh, I don't think this swarmed because look at all the bees that are in there. But it's usually a very, very strong colony. Uh, it's typically late spring, early summer. Uh, and you'll see queen cells in there. Now, one of the uh, things that uh, beekeepers will do, uh, they see queen cells and they start squashing them right away, okay? Uh, that's a dangerous thing to do uh, because if you do that and they've already swarmed, you've now left your colony with no way to survive. So when you get a colony, you see uh, queen cells, before you start trying to get rid of them, then um, you want to make sure that you have eggs or see the queen or somehow know it's okay. Uh, if you want to try to stop them from swarming, um, I can tell you once they've decided they want to swarm, it's very difficult to get them to change their mind. Um, but some of the things that you can do, uh, you could make a divide and, and take a lot of the bees away. You can uh, take some brood out, give it to a different colony, give them uh, some empty frames. Um, you also have to get rid of all of the queen cells that they have made. And unfortunately, they're good at hiding some of those. And so it's really easy to miss them, especially with that many bees in the colony. So um, it's really, really hard to get them to stop. So the key is to try to uh, manage your bees so they don't get started. Uh, we do it here primarily by doing a divide in May uh, and then we do reversals of the uh, colonies throughout the summer, uh, kind of break up the brood nest and keep them a little uh, out of sorts. Uh, sometimes they just do it anyway. Um, reproduction is hard to stop. Uh, so a little bit on uh, soup procedure is there time that bees will um, requeen. And in this case, uh, the queen is there. Uh, it's typically not a really strong colony because what the, what the bees are doing is they said, 
there's something wrong with this queen. We don't like her anymore. We want a new one. And <clears throat> so uh, they'll raise a new queen. And they uh, make cells. The queen lays eggs in the cells. Uh, apparently, she doesn't know what's up. Um, sometimes it's because uh, the queen's getting old and she doesn't have as much pheromone as she used to have. Uh, maybe she's uh, started to lay some drones because her spermatheca is running out of sperm. Uh, sometimes I think uh, it happens in a uh, colony that may, when you see this frame here is a, a virus issue and uh, the queen gets blamed for that. Uh, not just by the beekeepers, but I think also by the uh, bees. And so they raise a new queen. Um, I don't think they necessarily kill the old queen. So sometimes you go in there and they're uh, uh, superseding, you see the old queen there, and pretty soon you see two queens in there. And uh, then, of course, the beekeeper wants to get rid of one of them. Uh, the problem is, I can never tell which one is the right one to get rid of. Um, so I've always just left them. Uh, one, of, one of our uh, mantras now for beekeepers is, uh, if in doubt, do nothing. Uh, the bees have been doing this uh, long before we got involved. Uh, they survive in spite of us, not because of us. And, um, so if in doubt, let them uh, work it out. Uh, many times they know what to do. So when do bees uh, potentially raise uh, poor queens? And um, that's in an emergency, okay? And so why is that, why is that the case? Well, let me start here. What is a poor queen? So our measures of queen quality are uh, genetics, number of ovarials, which means how many eggs she can lay, her pheromone production, and the amount of sperm in the spermatheca. And uh, here's a picture you can see. Uh, these are the uh, ovarials. And each one of these tubes produces eggs. And you can see that they start out down here as a baby egg and it develops as it goes down. And then when it becomes a complete egg, then it gets uh, sent through. Uh, the spermatheca is here where the queen can uh, fertilize the egg as she lays it and uh, then it comes out and she puts it at the bottom or at the back of a cell. So the more of these ovarials you have, the more eggs she can lay in a day. Um, pheromone production is not on this chart. Those are those glands that I showed you um, in, in her head. And then the amount of sperm in the spermatheca uh, is partly uh, due to her mating, but it's partly due to the size of that spermatheca. So again, comparing the workers and the queens, um, added a few things on here, and those are the spermatheca, the ovarials, and the development time. Um, so you can see workers did not have a spermatheca, and so they could, um, that's why laying workers only have drones, because they don't have uh, any sperm available. And the number of ovarials for a queen is somewhere uh, in the 300 range. For workers, they have a few, but not very many, okay? So uh, this is important because, um, to explain why you possibly get poor queens from an emergency is remember that uh, all the larvae is fed royal jelly during that first uh, period, and then it switched to uh, royal jelly. And so <clears throat> if all of a sudden the queen uh, is killed, the bees know they have to raise a queen, but they have not started any of them directly from their very first day to be queens. And so they start feeding royal jelly to anything that's like two or three days old. Uh, some of them may have already been switched over uh, to being fed bee bread, but now get switched back to being royal jelly. And 
that queen that started out to be a worker but now got switched back and is now going to be a queen were the oldest ones and therefore they're going to be the first ones to come out uh, because they're already older and so the first one to come out goes around and kills the, all the other ones and so that one uh, that's not so good is likely to be the one uh, that becomes the queen okay so to try to uh oh uh so come keep these two things in it, okay and i'm going to try to give you a analogy for this in that um uh, so these two trucks here are uh, made by General Motors and uh, you know, Chevrolet GMC. Um, so pretend that this is the queen truck and this is the worker truck. And uh, they're made in the same factory, okay? And um, yeah, for those of you who know this truck, these are old models. So I don't know if this is even true anymore, but uh, this truck had a 20 gallon tank, this truck had a 19 gallon tank. And the reason for that was that um, GMC wanted to say they got more miles per tank full than the Chevy truck. Okay, so um, if I went ahead and I ordered uh, the Chevrolet truck and uh, I went to my dealer and they sent the order to the factory, the factory is making it and uh, then I talk to somebody about the 20 gallon tank. I decide I want a 20 gallon tank. I call them up and change my order. But the, the problem is that my truck's already half done. Okay, and they already have the tank put in it. Okay, well, uh, they may not change that. Okay, uh, it already comes coming off the line. All they have to do is put different stickers on and different light bulbs. Uh, and who's going to know about the tank anyway, right? And so when it comes out, uh, everything else is the same, but I've got uh, the wrong tank. So I'm not saying they actually do that, okay? This is just my example of what could happen. It's also what can happen uh, with the queens. And so those workers were started out, they were gonna have hardly any ovarials. Uh, they were not gonna have a Springer Fika. And then all of a sudden, uh, it got changed and said, well, forget that. We now have to uh, make you into a queen. And so it may be that that queen comes out with a smaller number of ovarials than it would have if it had been given royal jellies for the whole time. Sperm is thinking it might be a little bit smaller, so it can't hold as much sperm. All of those things that contribute to it not being as, as good a queen as it could have been. So why do they do that? Why, why would they uh, make a poor queen? Why don't they just only start with the, um, the youngest ones? And my analogy for that has to do with, um, again, cars. I'm a car guy, okay? So uh, when you have a flat tire on your car, what do you do, okay? You know what you're supposed to do, right? You're supposed to take it in and get it get a new tire put on your car right but how many of you do that right um you might go out and just try filling it up you know maybe it'll last for a few miles right um or you jack it up uh and change it or in my case i get someone else to do it for me right um but at any rate put on this emergency tire this is tantamount to an emergency queen okay um, it's going to get us where we want to go. Uh, it's going to be on the road, um, but it's not, you know, it's not a real tire, right? You can even see you're only supposed to go 50 miles an hour with that tire. So it's not an ideal thing, but it's getting us over the hump. And then eventually we go back and we, we get our tire put on. Well, that's what the, the queens do, uh, or the bees do also. They do that emergency queen, uh, they get a queen so that they're, they're back stable there. Uh, and then they can do a super seed and get the right queen uh, put in there. So it makes sense from, from the bee standpoint. Hey, so what do you do if you uh, have emergency queen? Um, first of all, if it's emergency queen, probably 
uh, you killed it, okay? Uh, so you should say you're sorry. <laughs> uh, and this is a classic case where uh, I would say just let them do their thing, okay? Um, if, if you really want to, you could go through and get all those cells out and get a new mate, a queen and put in there. And you could save a, a few weeks of time in terms of egg laying. Um, but again, that's a, it's a tough proposition to make sure you got every queen cell out of there and uh, to get a new queen introduced into the colony, okay? The other thing that you could do, uh, sometimes it doesn't work for them, okay? Uh, they put that funky tire on and uh, they went more than 50 miles an hour and it died. So sometimes you get in there and now you have uh, no eggs, no queen cells, no larvae, no anything. Uh, then generally what I like to do is give them a couple frames of young larvae from a different colony and let them uh, introduce their own queen. Um, introducing a new mated queen to a colony that's been uh, queenless for a long time, and then becomes what we call hopelessly clean, queenless. Um, they start, uh, workers start to uh, become laying workers, and it gets really difficult to introduce a new queen into that colony. Um, if you are gonna introduce a new queen, I would also add frames of uh, larvae from another colony along with that queen. That usually gives you a better chance of introducing a new queen. So just a uh, preview, um, the best queens come out before swarming um, and the mated queen leaves with the swarm. So you are gonna have uh, some time there when you're not gonna have a colony uh, with a queen that's laying eggs. Uh, two procedure um, is, is the bees replacing a queen that they think there's something wrong with. So I definitely wouldn't interfere with that. Um, you could either let them go ahead and do it on their own uh, or go through and get rid of that queen and put in a, a replacement queen. Um, but they're, they're, they're never gonna be happy with uh, the queen they have once they decide to supersede it, okay? And then uh, emergency queen, uh, again, usually that's from the beekeeper. Um, that can happen at almost any time. Um, so just a, a couple of quick notes on, on how to uh, stop killing queens. Um, I found that when I was a new beekeeper, queens didn't live as long as they do now. Um, and I, I finally admitted to myself, I was probably killing them off. So one is when you're going through the colony, um, take a frame out, uh, preferably a uh, honey frame off the outside edge. Leave that frame out as you go through the rest of the colony. So you have plenty of room to work in there without taking a frame out and rolling bees off across the um, side, which inevitably you kill the queen. Um, when you're looking at a frame, trying to get a habit of looking at it over top of the colony. So if the queen is on there and she accidentally falls off, she'll fall back into the colony. Um, there are a number of times I'm sure that the queens have uh, fallen off uh, in the grass and then you step on them or even if you don't step on them, you probably don't get them back in. Um, if, if you take a box off and then work uh, at removing frames and looking at them, you should have something under it, like a, uh, uh, we use the telescoping cover and we put the box on top of that, uh, kind of kitty up it so it doesn't smash down on the bees. But at least then if the queen falls off, she's in that cover. Um, the trick is to look at that before you put it back on to see if she's there and make sure that you get her back in the colony. So uh, th those kinds of things. We've had cases where uh, um, somebody has had the, been looking at a frame uh, and then they come over and say, hey, you know, look at this. 
and then you look at them and the queen's walking on their arm. And uh, so they're pretty tricky. You have to uh, be extra careful that uh, you don't do something to the queen while you're looking at it. Uh, okay, why not I just queens? I maybe don't know what an I just queen is, but uh, oftentimes I'll be at a meeting and um, I'll talk about some of this queen stuff and inevitably somebody will come up to me and say, well, I just do this or I just do that or I just do the other thing. And uh, the problem with uh, that is that sometimes they turn out to be turkeys. Okay, so uh, if you're going to raise queens or if you're going to uh, have a colony raise queens on their own, make sure you understand all this biology about queens so that you can uh, direct your bees to uh, raise a queen that's a good queen. And to do that, they need to start out uh, with very young larvae. And, and there are ways you can manipulate to do that. Uh, they have to have a lot of pollen to, to feed. Um, and those things are the primary uh, ways to get a good queen back in the colony. So if you uh, want more uh, information on biology, these are uh, three really good books. Uh, two of them are by Tom Seeley uh, and uh, the other one by Mark Winston. This has uh, been around for a long, long time, but it's got uh, really, really good information in it. Uh, and the more you know about how bees uh, do what they do, the better beekeeper you're going to be in the long run. So um, last but not least, think like a bee. Uh, for me, if I think of what's the best thing that I can think of, it's a blizzard. Um, but for a bee, that's not the best thing. For a bee, this is what they think is the best thing for them. So uh, I'm going to leave you with, uh, when in doubt, do nothing. Thank you, Gary. Ed, do you have uh, questions ready there? I do. Okay, I'll turn it over to you. I want to thanks, uh, say thanks again to Gary. Uh, and uh, here's some questions. All right, we have a few, Gary. Um, one thing a couple of people are wondering about is um, we've been hearing that um, propolis may have some beneficial effects in treatment against COVID-19. Can you speak to that at all? Uh, the short answer is no. Um, and, and I don't have anything being done on that uh, specifically right now. Uh, I mean, we do know that it does have some uh, antiviral, antiviral effects on some viruses, uh, but specifically about COVID-19, um, I don't know of anything. Okay. All right. Um, another one is, um, so you, you, you talk about splitting a lot in the spring. Um, and so people sometimes are concerned about the impact of, of splits on honey production. So have any insight into uh, good ways to uh, be proactive about swarm control um, without splitting? Um, yeah, let, let me do this in, in, in two parts. Um, I, our system uh, a management that we use here, uh, we do um, what's called a horizontal two queen system. So we winter our, we run our colonies that are gonna winter in three deep boxes, okay? And uh, the purpose of that is that it allows them to have two deep boxes basically for brood. The third box they fill with honey, which is their winter stores. And that generally um, prevents us from having swarm problems in the beginning of the year. Then uh, in the, once that colony comes through winter, then in the spring, we do uh, some reversals throughout early spring uh, to, to kind of move the brood around. And then uh, we do a divide in May. And uh, we now have two colonies. So we take the divide and that one, uh, we build up in three deep boxes again, and that becomes our next winter colony. And the 
other two boxes are left uh, with the old queen. We call that our parent colony. Um, we put supers on that right away. Uh, we let them use those two deep boxes for uh, brood. The honey all goes into the supers. And so that colony uh, is not expected to winter. Uh, we, don't win we don't prepare for winter in the fall. Uh, it's terminated and uh, we get the honey off of that. And so uh, th that's how we get the honey production from the colonies that we divide. In general, uh, and that colony, the two deep boxes, uh, we keep reversing them about every week to 10 days throughout the uh, summer. Uh, the, you still potentially have swarming problems. Um, the, we generally have a more problem, because uh, if they swarm, that's gonna cut into your honey production too. Sure. Okay. So uh, re reversals are helpful. A lot depends on how many colonies you have, okay? Um, so uh, I don't know. I, I think you can do a divide and not uh, seriously hurt your honey production uh, from the original colony. Um, okay. Uh, so now somebody wants to know how exactly you, you terminate that colony. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, what we do is, uh, as I said, they don't have much honey, uh, and so we leave them, uh, and, and they die of their own accord. Uh, we still treat them for mites, uh, if they have mites, because we don't want them to, um, you know, become other uh, colonies' mite bombs. So uh, we still treat them. Um, there, there are uh, ways uh, that I've heard of, none of which I, I care for in terms of how to, uh, you know, kill off the colony, if you will. Um, so we, we just leave them. Okay. Now, a surprising thing is sometimes we've left them, uh, and if we don't have bad winter, they're still fine in the spring. So. All right. Okay, uh, so you're asked to explain when you said you do uh, multiple reversals, uh, just what that means. Um, okay, so we would start in, well, in most years we would start in uh, probably mid-March. This year we just, uh, probably this week, it's gonna be our first time that temperature has gotten to a level where we can actually do something. Um, so uh, our first, uh, when we go out and look at the colony, uh, if, um, now again, remember we're in three deep boxes. Um, so what we would do is if the bees are uh, filled up that top box, if, you know, if that's full, we do what we call partial reversal. So we take uh, the middle box, put it on the top, the top box is in the middle. Uh, so now that gives us an empty box up above uh, for the bees to move up into. Uh, the reason for doing that is to get uh, the bees into uh, move into that top box easier. They'll move up before they'll move down. Then when that box is full, uh, we do what we call full reversal, which means the Top box goes on the bottom, the bottom box goes on the top. And then uh, we continue doing that full reversal every, uh, well, well, we we do it once the top box is full, then we do a full reversal. And then uh, we would do that every uh, week to 10 days until we do the divide. So it's a matter of just, um, moving the boxes around, keep an empty box uh, up on the top. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Uh, so uh, let's see, let's stick to that particular topic for a moment. Um, 
would you recommend reversal for people who only have two deeps? Uh, I would, yes, I would still reverse them. Um, one of the, um, yeah. So, the, yeah. See, I had spent a long time since I've done two deeps. <laughs> so, so uh, the first reversal, the, I will guess the box. See, this year was weird because normally we get out and, and the bees are in that top box and the, and the bottom box is basically empty, right? Uh, but this year, because the temperatures were, uh, they stayed cool so long, uh, we found a lot of our ours have, have actually gone down farther into uh, that bottom box. Um, but yeah, I would, I would reverse the two boxes, um, not too early in the spring, um, but starting now, you can turn those two boxes around and they will expand a little bit faster. Okay, that's, that's, that's what we recommend is fine. Um, when you do your splits, um, are you introducing a, a, a new mated queen or are you just uh, doing walk away? We are uh, introducing usually cells. We do our, we do queen rearing uh, cells. So we're usually introducing a cell uh, for our, uh, like hobby beekeepers here, we recommend they get a, a queen, a mated queen. Um, the, and, and it depends on what you call a walk away split. Um, what, I'm, what I'm not in favor of is, um, if, if you uh, just make a divide, set it off to the side and then literally walk away, um, I think you're gonna end up with a not so good queen because you'll end up with an emergency queen. Um, now, people have different um, strategies for uh, how they manage that. Uh, I've seen some where they mark the areas of the comb that have really young larvae, and then they come back, um, and you come back, say a week later, and then you can get rid of any of those cells that were formed from older larvae, and just keep the ones from the area you marked that was young larvae. Um, some people uh, take an, um, I forget what they call it, but you just take a hive tool and you kind of break away the comb below some really young larvae. Yeah, not yeah. Right. Yeah, they will tend to use those. Um, so if you do something like that to try to get them to use the younger larvae, that works out um, okay. Part of it is timing too. Because um, if you let them raise their own queen, um, you know, you're talking another week or, or more of being queenless. Um, but if you got the timing down so that uh, you can do that and you can um, and it'll still get ready for winter. Um, there's an advantage to that brood break from a mite. We didn't talk about mites, but uh, from a varroa mite perspective, that brood break uh, is a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, and I don't know, do you guys do any wintering of nukes out there? Yes. Um, so if, if your split's going into a nuke, then um, that doesn't take quite as much time for them to get ready for winter. Right. Okay, good. I think you covered that well. Um, so in the lab now, um, are you working on uh, any specific breeding for certain desirable characteristics? And um, what uh, successes might you be having with that? Yeah. Um, in fact, right now, that's the only project we're able to work on. So. Uh, the, the university here is shut down. Um, and so um, we, were, we were not able to start any new research this year, um, but our, uh, because our uh, breeding program is an ongoing program, uh, we're working on that. This is, our, uh, this is our second year actually into the program. So uh, I mentioned our primary uh, goal is uh, to do the propolis. Our, uh, uh, we're not just doing propolis. Um, so, for example, when we did the 
when we started the uh, hygienic line, uh, that was started not as a commercial uh, bee, but as a research bee. And so we bred strictly for hygienic behavior uh, and really didn't uh, include anything else because we wanted um, we, we wanted that trait specifically for research. Um, but this, this line that we're doing now, um, we're looking, uh, again, primarily at propolis. Uh, we're obviously looking at winter survival. Uh, all of our bees winter here. We don't take our bees um, anywhere else. So we're looking at winter survival, um, which is kind of an easy one. You just don't breed from the dead ones. And um, we're also looking at Varroa uh, in a couple of ways. And one is strictly um, uh, not treating, first of all, and then uh, looking at straight numbers, you know, which ones have more mites, which ones have fewer mites. Uh, we're also using a uh, strategy where we're looking at not necessarily the actual number of mites, but the, the bees that had the lowest increase in number of mites over the season. Um, so if one started with 10, the other one started with 30, uh, and they both ended up with 15, then uh, the one that started with 30 is better than the one that started with 10 because they actually went down. Um, so uh, that's the main uh, criteria. I mean, we do defensive behavior um, because we're, life's too short to deal with mean bees. <laughs> Uh, so uh, they're out because of that. Uh, we're also looking at honey production. Um, so those those things kind of uh, go together, you know. So if you look at a colony that uh, population-wise that does real well, uh, chances are it's going to uh, have a good honey crop. Um, we uh, we have two ways we look at honey production. And one is we, um, we look at the, the amount that we take off as um, harvest in the fall of the year. The other way that we do it is to uh, do what we call a two week weight gain. So in the middle of a strong honey flow, we weigh the colonies, the entire colony. And then we come back in two weeks and weigh it again. And we compare uh, the different colonies in terms of how much they put on. Okay, um, so that covers it for us. Um, we thank you uh, for, for that information and hopefully people got copied down your website info so they can check out the B-Lab website. And uh, with that, I, I think we're done. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Really appreciate it. Thanks again, Gary. I uh, really appreciate that. You're welcome. Have a good afternoon. Thanks, good luck with your bees. <laughs>